Hi there, and welcome to Social Capital Matters. I'm your host, Kylie Taylor. On this show, we take a deep dive into the ideas around social capital by talking to business and industry leaders about how they use it to collaborate with stakeholders and build a framework for long-term success. Hi everyone, welcome to episode three of Social Capital Matters. We've got a great show lined up for you today and a very interesting guest. I'm joined by my producer, Greg in Bangkok, who is running things behind the scene. How are you going, Greg? Hi, Kylie. I'm very, doing very well. Uh, it's actually uh, a very pertinent topic this week. I'm excited to start because the air in Bangkok uh, right now is so bad The pollution is so bad that the government has actually advised people to work from home today. So I'm really excited to talk about sustainability. So uh, why don't you introduce our guest for this episode? Indeed, our next guest on this episode is Dr. Darian McBain, a globally experienced Chief Sustainability Officer, Advisor and Board Member. Greg, there's so much here to say about Darian. I'm just going to read her bio. Darian McBain is a world-recognized expert speaker and author on sustainability, ESG, supply chains, business human rights, and sustainable finance. In a career spanning over 20 years, and um, she worked as the Global Director for Corporate Affairs at Thai Union Group and as the Chief Sustainability Officer for Singapore's Monetary Authority. Currently, she's the Head of Outsourced Chief Sustainability Officer, a Singapore-based advisory firm that enables businesses to run a sustainability function without hiring a full-time Chief Sustainability Officer. So I can't wait to talk to her. So let's get on to talking to Dr. McBain. Hi, Darian. Welcome to Social Capital Matters. Great to see you. Hey, Kaylee. Great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Right. You've worked across a number of industries from environmental protection to pollution to healthcare to finance and fisheries, and now you're embarking on a new adventure. Can you start by telling everyone a little bit about what you're doing now? So my new adventure is Outsource Chief Sustainability Officer Asia. So as you said, Kylie, I have worked really across the world. I've worked in Australia, the UK, a bit in the US and a lot in Asia over the past decade. And I see that there's a great need for all of the companies, perhaps below that top tier of the multinationals, who really need the strategic advice of a chief sustainability officer, but aren't necessarily willing to invest in one full time, or perhaps they don't quite know what they want. And so I want to fractionalize my time and be an outsourced chief sustainability officer, um, but also working with ESG tech and sustainability tech to outsource a lot of the things that take time and effort when you're working on sustainability, like gathering data and reporting um, and outsource that to technology players. So in a sense, it's bringing both together the human knowledge with technology support. Look, when you told me what you were going to do, I could instantly see the need for it. I think the opportunity for companies to be able to tap top shelf chief sustainability officer expertise and to actually get some help building the sorts of ecosystems they need within their company to to manage and report on their ESG it is something that's really necessary. It's a real gap in the market. And um, I think it's very timely. Now, I first came across you when I saw the great work you were doing at Thai Union Group, the, the work called Sea Change. And we'll come to that a little bit later. But um, I was particularly impressed by all that work. I'd be interested to ask you, um, in all the years that you've been working in this space, what's changed? What's new and different now? I think the enthusiasm for ESG and sustainability has definitely changed. So I trained in Australia as an environmental engineer. I've always worked in this space, and it was actually the first degree that uh, was run in the University of New South Wales. It was the first degree in Australia on environmental engineering. And no one was really sure what we were going to be doing. We thought maybe we'd work in councils and build good bridges, perhaps, preventing uh, flooding. So this was in the 90s. 
And it was after the first uh, World Environment Summit in Rio, uh, the Brundtland Report with the definition of sustainable development had come out. Climate change was discussed, it was understood, but it wasn't the driving force. And if we fast forward to where we are now in 2023, everybody talks about climate change. It is world headlines every day. If we look at what was discussed at Davos, it's a big topic for discussion. And I think what's changed is how businesses are looking at sustainability and governments, although I don't think it's changed to the extent that it's having a particularly good impact. In fact, we're still going backwards with the emissions um, and the loss of nature, Mm. uh, inequality. So there's many issues. So there's more conversations but I, I don't necessarily see better progress. So you don't think the urgency um, is there yet to, to get to where we need to be? I think there's urgency on behalf of some people. I mean, if you look at Greta Thunberg, for example, yeah. plenty of urgency there and, and very bold calls telling the world that we have to change. And there are many people like that. I think corporations are still and governments looking at the old model of business and perhaps not focusing on what the opportunities of a new model of business are. If we genuinely are to decarbonize, that is a green revolution. We, you know, we are going to change so many different systems, um, including our energy system, and that will bring with it opportunities and winners and losers. And I think governments and business need to see those opportunities and start making that change now. But I think there's a very strong old guard that are keeping us back in the fossil fuel dominated uh, century that we've just had. Well, we're actually seeing a bit of a sort of woke culture wars, if you like. Um, And, you know, we're even seeing some places like uh, recently uh, Florida in the US introducing legislation to limit or or ban ESG investments. We're seeing some announcements by banks and investment houses saying they're moving away from um, their ESG investment portfolio. Um, We're even hearing talk about, like, say, banning electric cars. Um, Why has this become so divisive? And, And what do you think, who will win? Will the woke forces win or the reactionary forces I suspect it's become so divisive, going back to my previous comment, because it is a battle between the old guard and the new guard. There were definitely winners from, let's call it the old guard, the old economy. So those, the oil and gas companies, the car manufacturers, uh, perhaps the airlines, you can think through many of these big corporations. And of course, they are trying to hold on to the advantage that they have because if there is a green revolution, they might not be in that advantageous position. Of course, they could be. And if they were investing in renewables and genuinely taking a sustainable approach, and by sustainability, I'm going back to sort of the Brentland definition, which is uh, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising future generations. So if you're taking that intergenerational approach, I think that is where you're starting to get the uh, perhaps fighting against wokeism because when you look at what ESG actually is, environment, social and governance, it would be hard to argue for any organisation that, say, energy efficiency doesn't make sense or that diversity doesn't make sense. Many of these things have very fundamental, understandable business continuity aspects, but when they're put together as a campaign, I think that's when people start to rebel against them. There was um, a great comment coming out of um, Davos recently that we've talked about, the um, CEO of Coca-Cola, who said if ESG becomes a toxic phrase, um, which it has in the US, it doesn't matter to me. Um, He said, I'm just going to stop saying ESG. Um, But no one with any common sense can say being water positive, reducing sugar or being part of a circular economy are bad ideas. 
So he's basically saying um, along very similar lines of what you were saying, if you've got common sense, you've got to see that all these things are actually good outcomes, not just for the future generation and um, for people and communities, but they're good for business as well. Yes, I would support what he says. And you asked me previously, Kylie, you know, what's changed since I got into this industry. ESG was not a term. Nobody spoke about ESG 20 years ago. I believe that's a relatively recent uh, phenomena. And it comes out of the financial sector in particular, looking at the data points, the ESG data points on its own. It isn't really a concept. And to If you drop the term ESG, that doesn't change what you're trying to do. And if you look at the businesses who have purpose, and I was speaking to someone about this recently this week. Um, So a company like Patagonia or Tony's Chocoloni, which has a goal of being slavery free, they aren't talking about ESG. They are actually trying to talk about what their business purpose is, they talk about their product and how their business can deliver against its purpose. So to remove ESG from those businesses who know what they're trying to achieve, who understand their value, I don't think it will make a significant difference. Yeah. So that does touch on the whole area of measurement and monitoring and reporting. Um, What's your view on, you know, ESG ratings? Which ratings or rankings um, should people be looking at? Do they really matter? Um, Are the investors looking at the right things? Or do you think this is adding sort of complexity to the whole issue? What would you be advising your organisations to do around um, what they report and measure? I think we can look at this from two different perspectives. So if you're coming from a corporate perspective, you're the organisation who's likely to be gathering that data. So across the ESG pillars, putting it into a format, uh, some of the ratings agencies will assess what is publicly available. Others will ask you to complete a survey or a form. And so you have an opportunity to influence how your company or organisation is being perceived by particularly the financial markets. Um, And you also have an opportunity to use that data to improve your performance. If you're only looking at the ratings, I would say that's like taking the pulse of a patient if they showed up to emergency. It tells you something. It tells you the patient's alive. But if you really want to be granular, you need to go and do much more in-depth studies and information, and you need to know what it is you're trying to find out, what are the questions. And so financial institutions who really put a lot of effort into managing their risk and understanding the returns will go on site. They will go and talk to the companies. I can remember when I was at Thai Union uh, when we were first looking at a sustainability-linked loan. I spent a lot of time looking to our different uh, financiers and explaining what we were doing on sustainability and then our sea change strategy. So I think there's a role for ESG ratings, but it's not the only role. You can't ignore the role of regulators, for example, and it's not just financial regulators. There's environmental regulators. There's corporate governance regulations. So there's a very strong role of regulation There's a strong role in transparency and reporting, um, but also this is where I see the opportunity for technology. So when we look at uh, technology for helping to collect data um, so you can connect meters directly to reporting systems that can then convert it into a format that could report against the TCFD or Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures Framework. So that's a big technology leap. There's reg tech, which helps you look at the different regulations that exist. So ESG ratings have a place and a purpose, but they certainly aren't everything. Mm. I, I think the point you made about technology is particularly important, especially when we talked about the, the types of companies that um, you know are in need of an outsourced chief sustainability officer. I think what prevents many companies from being as great as they could be in this area is that they're overwhelmed by the manual tasks um, ahead of them to actually 
do this well, get into all the details and um, create the, the information and the data they need in their organisations to properly manage their um, ESG commitments. And what I've heard from you about the um, ESG technology platforms that are available, I think that's a very exciting opportunity that's going to help many people leap forward. And I think it's a great opportunity, particularly for Asia. It isn't to say that the US and Europe isn't doing that. But in some ways, we often think that Asia isn't as advanced. I actually think on some of these technology platforms, and I say this having worked with the fintech sector quite a lot in my previous role with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, it is starting to leapfrog. And when I speak to companies in Europe, I think there's some real innovations that are taking place in Asia and it's a great opportunity not to go through a slow learning process but to really accelerate change, embrace technology, accept that disclosures on ESG data, no matter what you call it, are going to be coming down the line. So, Kylie, we've discussed the International Sustainability Standards Board, yes. um, which will most likely require uh, all different organisations uh, and usually regulators are going to start requiring disclosures against an international standard framework. Therefore, I don't think there's an option for many organisations to say they're not going to collect ESG data, no matter what it's called, But I do think there is an option where they can proactively say, let's be smart about how we collect and share this data. So let's um, keep um, talking about Asia for a minute and and, and Southeast Asia in particular, a part of the world that both you and I have done um, a lot of work in. And as I mentioned before, I first came across you with the work you were doing um, in the um, fisheries sector with Thai Union Group and that, that program was called Sea Change. Um, that was at a time when there was um, a lot going on and I remember a particular documentary um, on, you know, um, what was going on in the fishing industry and it traced the supply chain back to Southeast Asia and really exposed a lot of practices overall in that industry that weren't great. But, I mean, that wasn't the only documentary. There's been lots of documentaries tracing supply chains. I mean, remember um, several years ago now when the Rana Plaza in Bangladesh collapsed, um, we had a realisation at that point that, um, you know, people started saying, well, is that where our clothes come from? Is that where our brands are made? So every supply chain or many, many supply chains emanate from Southeast Asia or pass through Southeast Asia at some point. And I know um, supply chains is an area you've worked a lot on in your um, career. Um, How do you think um, organisations can, um, you know, better ensure that their supply chains are meeting their standards? Because if you're on the other side of the world, you, you may not, you know, really understand what you're dealing with. I think it's vital if a business is going to be sustainable, um, but also I mean that in a business sense, business continuity, yeah. you need to understand your supply chains. And I'll give a, a small anecdote. You mentioned about Thai Union and our strategy. Uh, when a lot of these issues came up, and one of the the first issues was slavery at sea. And yeah. so there was a big expose done by The Guardian in the UK at the time Uh, that looked at slavery at sea, so there were what they called ghost ships that were off the Gulf of Thailand. People were being trafficked onto those ships. They were being forced to work. Uh, The fish that was caught was processed to fish meal, being sent back to Thailand where it was processed into shrimp feed, uh, prawn feed for those in Australia, same thing, shrimp and prawns, uh, where it was then fed to the shrimp uh, and then those shrimp were being processed by a company like Thai Union Uh, and then sent to customers all around the world, the big retailers. There was no point in Thai Union saying, oh, that's not us, that's our supply chain, because actually we were the ones who then faced the customers and then the customers faced the consumers. So Thai Union dealt with the retailers, the retailers dealt with the consumers, and actually the buck did stop with us. And so I had to know, All of those details we had for this shrimp supply chain, you know, go to the seventh and eighth tier. 
and understand what was happening, understand how people were being paid on vessels that we did not own. We had no controlling share in these vessels that were in our supply chain, how they were being treated at the ports, the, the shifts that they were working, the times that they were working, even though I think in perhaps an old style of outsource management, you would say, well, that's all outsourced. That is not yeah. our responsibility. And you're increasingly seeing regulations and legislation that are enforcing a, a duty of care and due yeah. diligence that goes all along your supply chain. It started very firmly in regulations around modern slavery. Um, so you've got the Modern Slavery Act in the UK and in Australia. You have a, a different approach on forced labour from the US, but they are all common in that you cannot say that's not just my operation. You can't outsource responsibility for your supply chain. And increasingly, other legislation will also make companies have to understand what's happening in your supply chain. So it's difficult to understand, but it is definitely worth putting the effort in. Again, if I go back to my PhD, it was using a tool called multi-regional input-output analysis to see what you can understand about global supply chains without actually going uh, out in the field. And so that is another platform where I think people can use that to un better understand the global supply chains. And it actually follows the money. It, it follows money flows from between countries if you're using a multi-regional model. And so there are, there are tools that can make this easier rather than just following your product all the way along each step. But it is pretty vital for businesses to start to understand what their business model is. And even from a risk management and a business continuity perspective, you should understand that. And we saw that during the pandemic, that people's supply chains fell apart, really. And one of the best outcomes for Thai Union, I think, during the pandemic, so people were pantry stocking. You know, they were keeping things like cans of tuna uh, in their pantry for the pandemic. Thai Union was one of the only large seafood producers that could continue to produce during the pandemic, one, because we had very good conditions for our workers that already took into account all sorts of infection control, a lot of personal protective equipment. But two, we had these great relationships with our suppliers so that we, when we needed to pivot, when things were changing very rapidly, we could work collaboratively with our suppliers. And both of those were perhaps things that at least partly came out of the sustainability strategy, but they had genuine business benefits. Yeah. When, um, whenever we look at um, corporate reputation issues, and I'm thinking of a number of the issues we've dealt with um, in recent times for clients, um, nine times out of 10, it's an issue in the supply chain. And you're absolutely right that it's uh, no longer acceptable or appropriate to say, well, that's not us, that's our supplier or that's a partner or that's someone we work with. Um, your, your consumer and your audience expects you to be responsible for, for what you deliver in all aspects of it. So I uh, couldn't agree more. One of the things uh, you and I have talked about, and it's a really interesting concept to me, is unintended consequences. You've talked about um, this being one of the real watch outs that you think people need to think about when putting their sustainability strategies together. Um, could you explain that a little bit more? Sure. So I think there's unintended consequences from focusing very narrowly just on one outcome and where this is most obvious is in climate change. And so you see a lot of both organisations but also governments who are so focused on reducing carbon emissions at all costs. And this is often called carbon tunnel vision, right. it's meaning that that is all that you're looking at. But if that's all you're measuring, how you reduce your carbon emissions, you're going to miss everything about, let's say, nature. Let's talk about water, biodiversity loss, and people, I mean, we're not going to have this green revolution if people aren't on board. Governments will be overthrown, essentially, which sounds dramatic. But if people don't have access to food or to water or to energy or to education, uh, then there will most likely be a, a change in government. And so if you're not actually putting people at the centre of why are we doing some of this work, you will get a very different outcome. And so... 
by unintended consequences, I see, for example, if you're just looking at a transition plan, how to reduce carbon at all costs, you may miss, one, the opportunities, but two, all of the other negative consequences from not taking a much more strategic approach to what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. I think before we run out of time, it would be really remiss if we didn't talk about the finance sector for a moment, because, of course, you've spent um, most of the last year as the first um, chief sustainability officer for Singapore's monetary authority. And I'd, I'd love to just hear a little bit more about the role you see that the finance industry can play in moving sustainability forward. So I really came across finance as a new driving force when I was with Thai Union and we started to look at sustainability linked finance. So these are loans and bonds which are linked to sustainability performance and going through that process. And it made me interested because it really ties an organisation, depending on the kind of product, to Achieving over, let's say, a three to five year period of a loan, achieving sustainability outcomes. So no longer are you only doing this for regulatory reasons or only doing it for stakeholder expectations, which are two very good reasons to be doing sustainability. But a third reason could be access to finance. So it it could be uh, access to capital. It could be for investment in your business. It could be for insurance. Insurance companies are looking at how you manage uh, your impacts, but also how you're managing climate change. And we saw at COP26, which was the one in Glasgow in the UK for the first time at Finance Day, and that COP did very much elevate finance as being one of the solutions that we should be looking at. And out of there was the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, which goes across all different aspects of the financial industry. So you'll find that if all of the financial sector is committing to net zero, as they were trying to get with the GFANS, Glasgow Financial Alliance, then the finance sector is going to be influencing their customers to also go to net zero because they need to decarbonize their books And in this way, you do see finance as being quite a driving tool. And as you mentioned, I joined the Monetary Authority of Singapore and they were the first monetary authority, well, the first central bank that I'm aware of to have a chief sustainability officer. And that is also interesting. You know, what is the role of central bank and how does that relate to climate change? So Mark Carney, who's the former governor of the Reserve Bank of England, Uh, was actually leading on the Glasgow Financial Alliance. And so you see central banks now looking at the impacts of climate change on financial stability and increasingly looking at broader topics like transition and nature as well. So it's a very interesting time for finance to find out what those levers are and how they can accelerate change. Um, But I would also say it can't all be down to finance. It's not the only answer. We still need strong regulations and we still need corporates to take a firm stance in what they're trying to do. And going back to my point about carbon tunnel vision, you know, the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals across a very broad range, I would say no company should only focus just on climate action. They they should take in a, a broader perspective than just climate change. So one of the things we like to do um, at the end of our podcast is talk about the what, the takeaway, the one thing um, people need to know or remember. I think what would be really good for us to just finish on is if I'm a, an organisation and I need, I know I need to update my ESG framework or I actually need to, I'm at the starting gates and I need to start putting it together, um, have you got some sort of hot tips or, or key guidelines on how how do you get started? What do you do? First couple of steps to make sure you're you're stepping off in the right direction to make some good progress in this area. Think strategically about what your priorities are and what you're trying to achieve. 
Think about your stakeholders and what is material to you. And there will be some issues that are really front and centre and they are the ones that you should focus on first because sustainability is a journey. You won't ever really be at the end. And so you can't do everything at once. You can't boil the ocean. Make sure you focus on those issues which are strategic to you to start with and take practical steps. Don't assume sustainability is a communications tool. It can be used for communications, but it is genuinely about aligning your business with an outcome that has a a better impact for people and planet. Darian, you always make such good common sense when you explain these concepts. Thank you. It's been really good to talk to you. It's been great to talk to you, Kylie. Greg, that was a really great discussion with Dr. McBain. I really enjoy talking to Darren. And in particular, I liked the point she made about um, putting people at the center. If organizations just put people at the center and what they want to achieve strategically and start there and take a common sense approach, then they're going to build the right kind of framework. I think that was eminently sensible. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And when people are the center of everything, everything flows on from there. I think we've all seen a lot of instances and examples of where the the, the people of an organization are seen as, you know, the <laughs> the laborers and nothing more, the people that drive value for the company, but it should be the opposite way around, I think. Yeah. Very smart. Yeah. And it, that's why, you know, whenever we work with clients, we always start with some form of stakeholder research or stakeholder survey. So we're out there talking to the people that are part of the business, be they the employees, the local community, the customers, the partners, any other stakeholders, because when organisations really put those relationships and those people first, you can build the right kind of strategic program, be it your sustainability program, your stakeholder engagement program, your communications program. So um, as you know, we're working um, with Darian on a couple of client mandates at the moment. So Mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to um, getting into that and working with her. Right. I was really fascinated by what she said about unintended consequences. And I think uh, was, I think she called it the, the tunnel vision that you have often when you only see your goal. And the only thing I could think about was uh, about a year ago, or maybe a bit more than that in Thailand here, they outlawed the use of plastic bags. And I was like, fantastic. This is great. This is what they did in Canada when I was a kid. It worked out well. There's an per- initial period of adjustment, you know, but now I find myself, I've got a bag full of these cloth bags that I don't know what to do with. So I'm, I'm all for reducing plastic and I still use them. But now one unintended consequence of that is that I think everyone now has these giant collections of bags at home that they don't know how to use. That it's way too much more than they need. So, um, you know, it's funny that, that, that I thought of that, but it's definitely a big problem when you're dealing with much bigger issues. There'll be a program for that soon too. Don't worry. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. But it was great chatting with her. Some really, really cool stuff came out of that. I agree. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. Don't miss the next episode in our series, exploring the brightest minds and the most important issues in the world of social capital. See you then. Social Capital Matters has been a production of Baldwin Boyle Group, hosted by Kylie Taylor and produced and edited by Greg Jorgensen. Find more episodes in our ongoing series on baldwinboyle.com slash podcasts, watch on YouTube, or listen wherever you find your podcasts. Mm-hmm.